The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. to start with the scripture that we saw change when we had minimal time and Jennifer and I would be going church to church and someone would come up and and quite frankly they didn't even know if they were saved or not you know oh, I, I know the Bible said so and I read I, I said a prayer after somebody so we wanted to give them that assurance of their salvation and the scripture will be key even in getting free from an orphan spirit is uh, we would have them stand up here or in line in an altar ministry, have them close their eyes, have their hand down here where their spirit is. This is where your will and your conscience and the seat of the emotions. Conscience is not in your head. Conscience is in your gut. It's in your spirit, saved or unsaved. Your conscience is in the gut. So I had them put their hand here and tell me, how did it resonate? As simple as this, good or bad? How does this feel? And here's what I did. Close your eyes. Had them get in an attitude of prayer. And I would, remember, we don't know if they're saved or not. And I had them close their eyes and I quoted to them 1 John 3, 1. I said, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. Did that feel good or bad? If it felt bad, you need a sinner's prayer. The only one that should, that should feel bad would be an unsaved individual. Now, you could be religious and unsaved. You could have gone to church for a long time and still been unsaved. But it won't feel, you won't feel the peace. You won't feel the good connection. Even if you felt nothing would mean that you're in harmony with that statement. Do you realize how important that is? You've got to learn to go with the gut. The gut knows things your head doesn't know. Now... Here's the thing, the, uh, in order to get free from an orphan spirit, we need to understand that there was a, an original intent. I like when Jennifer teaches on the Constitution and people try to twist and work with it. We go back to original intent. What was the original intent of the Founding Fathers? Not some later interpretation that kind of twists it. All right. What was the original intent? Well, in the book of Genesis, God gave us our original int intent. And there's four elements. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continually give you four elements because these four elements are a process that needs to be spiritual, not mental. All right. The first one is in Genesis 1, uh, around 27, 28, 29, in that general area. Um, God gave the original intent that he created man in his own image and according to his likeness. They were to have dominion and reproduce, okay? But here's what it is. In Genesis 1, the original intent was one, and, and by the way, uh, this also works with the four predestined, because Jennifer looked up four predestined in the Bible, and it matches the original intent. Well, doesn't that make sense? That God's original intent for you would match Anything the Bible says was uh, predestined? Okay, well, first of all, number one, you were predestined. This is actually Romans 8.30, but you were predestined for a relationship. You were called. Behold what man... If, look, I want you to be fathered by God, and you're going to need to deal with some stuff in the process. Trust me. But you were created. Your original intent... Don't you think we ought to get back to the original intent... Because quite frankly, you brought baggage in when you got saved. <laughs> you brought some distortions. Let's get back to original intent. Was God creating me for a relationship? And that's I'm going to pursue. Secondly, in this relationship, sequentially, because God builds upon a, a, a foundation and it's gradual. And this is going to be the battle cry through this whole message. And it should be your battle cry. You can't skip steps. Oh, how we love to skip steps. We just love to do that. All right? But God wants a relationship, 
before you're going to be conformed to the love nature of Jesus. That's the second step. You were, you were called into a relationship to be conformed. So part two of a sequence is you will not change. You will not change in the way that God made you as a one of a kind. Something, there never will be another you. There never was another you. So why would you want to be a copy? Why would you want to not take partake of the fact of the beautiful truth that you're an original? Really, there'll never be another you. So original intent says, I created you for a relationship. And in that relationship, I'm expecting you to become more and more conformed to my image. Because you see, as a child, this father loving a child wants to express himself to you and through you. Thirdly, Ephesians 1.5 talks that we are called, predestined to be sons. And the third element is really just simply function. You know, think about this. Wouldn't you like to function? I mean, function according to the way God predestined you to function. That's a whole lot different than the way people choose to function. You function according, and we used to call this when a person is functioning in the predestined plan that God had for them as sons and daughters. Remember, behold how precious that is, how precious that is. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. But in that process of being called a child of God, I need to become that child of God. You've got to get born again. Then you have to be, allow him to transform your character. And then thirdly, you function out of a rest or the peace of God. And you've heard that over and over in this church. It's two answers to most questions. Forgiveness and peace. All right. If ever in doubt, look for the peace. And if you don't know what to do, forgive. <laughs> All right. Forgiving. Forgiving is love where the rubber meets the road. It's the real thing. All right. So if that's the original intent, and you are functioning according to the peace. Guess what you do? Guess what happens as a child of God? You reproduce according to kind, meaning you can only reproduce according to how far you are. All right? So the second concept of four elements is if that was the original intent, then that should match the original need. You had a need. An original intent will meet the original need. The original need is number one, trust. Remember we said a trusting relationship. Number two, love. Number three, value. And number four, purpose. I'm going to say that again. The original need that we all have is we have a need for trust, a trusting relationship. We have a need for true agape love, real love, not what the world calls love. Most of the time it's just lust. All right. The third element is value or worth. And the fourth element is purpose. Now, if you look at those four, God had an original intent for your life to go through four elements. These four elements are a hierarchy is the way we've taught it, a hierarchy of need. You cannot skip to love by skipping trust. Trust is foundational. Trust takes time. We'd like to skip to the love right away though, right? I love, I love, I love. If you are in an abusive relationship, I'm telling you what would need to be restored first would be trust, not love. People can love, 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 but trust. Jesse Penn Lewis says, you can't even receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior without trusting him to come in. So that means there's a vulnerability in trust. That means I'm going to hold my heart open with wisdom till love comes through. In other words, that's the way it's tested properly. So you cannot 
skip steps. If there's anything you can get out of this message, you want to be free from an orphan spirit and be a true son and daughter of God. This is the way you get rid of the orphan spirit. And believe me, many, many have it in the church. But the goal is from the beginning was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers to make ready a people prepared. Now, when we talk about fathers, we'll talk more about that because uh, now if there's an original intent and you see there's an original need, we need to move from trust to love. Do you know what people do too? The third step is value. That value should be intrinsic coming out of that beautiful love relationship that you are precious in the sight of God. Precious was a key word I learned when the school of the spirit. I kept, when I was training Jennifer even, I would, I would say, you hold it in your heart, any truth God gives you as precious, and you just stay there. If it's really precious, you stay there. You don't move on. What people try to do is they try to skip through that preciousness and trusting God and love and jump to value. And what do people do for value? They'll jump ahead and find something like a title or a position or an activity that makes them feel good about themselves. Or worse, they, we talked about the rejection last week. They will have to have the approval of certain people to feel good about themselves. Those are all shortcuts that don't work. The only value or worth is that I'm a Sabbath son or a Sabbath daughter. What does a Sabbath son or a Sabbath daughter do? They walk in the supernatural peace of God. Let the peace of God rule. They literally have a relationship with Jesus where peace rules most of the time. Even if it feels like nothing. Nothing means at least there's nothing pulling you away from that habitation of God in the Spirit. And you are capable of being led by the Spirit now because you've got peace. Sabbath sons is where the value is. And when you're at peace and you're not struggling with trying to make yourself valuable with trophies, scholarships, titles, numbers, whatever, uh, whatever people plug in is actually a substitute. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewn for themselves substitutes. Why did they do that? To meet a, an original need. God says, I want to meet that original need, and I want you to meet it righteously. Don't go looking for substitutes because it's very temporary. And people build up a whole system, uh, like a house of thoughts and activities that is not God. It's something that they've built themselves. And we know unless the Lord builds the house, this house, you labor in vain. Now, if the original intent was for relationship, for the nature of God to function properly, to reproduce according to kind, the original need was you start meeting the trust in that relationship with God, you start experiencing and cherishing the love of God, your value now is intrinsic, which means in your obedience to God, you're doing stuff to please Him, not get for yourself. I'm satisfied enough in Him that now my primary motive, what's flowing out of my spirit, is to satisfy the heart of God. Now, <clears throat> Remember that part. Satisfy the heart of God. Satisfy <clears throat> the heart of God. Because we're going to get back to that. Now, in order for this original intent and this original need to be met, guess what else there is? There's spiritual laws to relationship in order to meet that need. Don't you want to know what they are? <laughs> because... All right, I see the original intent, that God, the way God created me. I see that I have a, a need. I want it met righteously. But God says, I'm giving you spiritual laws to <clears throat> relationship or a solution to the need, whatever you want to call it. Laws of relationship or a solution to the needs. And here's another four. Four spiritual laws. Number one, you must appreciate 
that in the natural and in the spiritual, and I, I'm more concerned with the spiritual, there is a law. You don't have to believe in this law. You don't have to like the law, but it works. It's called sowing and reaping. And Jesus even stated in the scriptures, if you don't understand this principle, this parable, how will you understand anything? Because it's like the all-encompassing law of reciprocity is the entire kingdom of God. It's the way God works. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Sowing and reaping <clears throat> is a solution to what you need. Sowing and reaping is the number one spiritual law. Secondly, and this one was a shock to me, <clears throat> because it, it healed me of temper tantrums. Um, when I was a young Christian, if it felt like I, I did everything right and it's not working. <laughs> did you ever do that one? I did everything right and it's not working. All right. Well, the Lord had to show me that with the law of sowing and reaping, there's another law. It's called a law of increase. You sow to the wind, you reap the, wheel, the whirlwind. In other words, you sow a seed, you get a harvest. So all of a sudden I saw that Oh, my temper tantrum, I was telling God how much how upset I was. But what I didn't realize is that while you're being upset, it's growing. <laughs> you're making it worse. <laughs> and the law of increase says, you sow that, Dennis? Let's see how long you're going to sow that. How long are you going to pout? How long are you going to keep that attitude? Because seed, weed seed attitudes grow. All right, and actually in the message, I love it. It's uh, the message translations takes a lot of liberty, but I just love it. And uh, it says, uh, <clears throat> "Lust, lust gets pregnant and has a baby called sin. Sin grows up and becomes a big killer. You got killer in your life. The early church, even in the Didache." The, those new believers that were Gentiles, that were biblically clueless, they were taught fences. In other words, murder and adultery does not fall out of the sky. If there's adultery, there is lust that you never put a fence around. In other words, you never dealt with the lust at the lower level. If, if you commit murder, that didn't just happen. You've got an anger problem. That didn't just fall out of the sky. All right? So... <clears throat> The law of increase needs to be understood that you're wise to deal quickly with anything. Prompt obedience is a good thing, but also when you, when you mess up, deal quickly. So the spiritual laws, and you, you don't have to like these laws, but guess what? They work. If you see someone that's been pretty messed up, guess what? There's some fences that they didn't deal with. All right? Which brings us to the third one. And this one can be difficult to understand at times, but this is what our whole ministry is based on. And that's why people should take the 60-day challenge. That's why people should take all of the modules, not some of them, and not think that I already know this stuff. Because in the process, I'm seeing major leaders all of a sudden confessing publicly, oh, God showed me this. God showed me that. I had one recently. It was a good one. Dennis Miller. Poor guy. That was, uh, I think it was, must have been well, fifth grade, so that would be before junior high. In the fifth grade, I had a neighbor boy, and uh, thank God I, you know, sin grows up and is a real killer. The only thing that saved me in South Chicago is I stayed little. Otherwise, I think I'd have been a bully. Unsaved, I'd have just been a bully, because Dennis Miller had this green snot coming out of his nose, <laughs> and he, he was in school and didn't know enough to wipe his nose. Well, I played authority figure there. I wouldn't let him on the school bus. Then his mother called my mother, of course, right? That's, that's what mothers do. <laughs> why did your son not let my son on the school bus? And my mom said, why did you do that? Typical mother. Because he's doesn't have any common sense. He, he's old enough now, he should wipe his nose. So how gross that is to get on the bus and everybody's got to look at that green snot coming out of his nose. So I didn't. Uh, now fortunately, I was a 95-pound wrestler in my freshman year of high school, so 
I think the only thing that kept me from being a bully was staying small enough to where I better have some big friends because <laughs> in South Chicago, uh, my chances were kind of limp. But God's still dealing with that kind of stuff because I said, so God, what, what are you dealing with me now after 45 years? You know, what was that truth about Dennis Miller? And it was a root issue to where God just showed me that when, when uh, you, you judge and you don't even know you're judging on the road particularly, I expect everyone to have common sense. Because it, to me, it's never been a matter of intelligence. It's been a matter of common sense. And Dennis Miller didn't have any common sense. I released that judgment against him and said, who knows? Who knows what kind of life he's living? Who knows what strengths or weaknesses he has? And, and I received forgiveness for that. And all of a sudden, I saw people do making left-hand turns from the right lane. I still don't know. I, I know everybody here wasn't raised in a city their whole life, but in this general Fort Mill, Charlotte area, when there's three lanes and one goes left and one goes straight and one goes right, I don't think it's that complicated. But now I have to leave mercy for that person in the right lane who was going to make a left-hand turn and just go, oh, well, bless his heart. For one, that's Southern. Bless his heart for one... one but for the grace of God, there go I, if all of a sudden I was daydreaming or found out someone was in the hospital or you don't know the circumstances that God says, I'm going to increase your discernment. And this word was for me, but this word is for you too. I will increase your discernment when you give up the right to judge. Whoa, but I, and Jennifer would always tell me, there's a bell curve out there. Not everybody's on the high end of the bell curve. And they're all driving, and they've got driver's licenses. And who knows what's going on in their life? And I'll tell you what, we should be, uh, do justice, love mercy. Not love justice, <laughs> uh, do some occasional mercy. <laughs> That's not what the scripture says, right? So I'm looking at that, and all of a sudden now, it's like... Uh, you know what, you're all on a, on a level playing field and you're all one of a kind and you're all different. And I actually think this would help you in raising children or spiritual children is loving the differences and learning to navigate with those differences. What do you do with those differences? You know, the way you discipline one child is not the same way you discipline another child. They are uniquely different and you need to know what their unique giftings are. What, what is their potential? Don't make them into you. You know, I've seen people, fathers that love sports, force their child into sports and everything. Maybe you don't want to. If you were really a loving father, raise them in the way that you go. You don't make them like you. Don't make them a copycat of you. What you should be doing is what does the scripture say? Train up a child in a way he shall go. And that presupposes that you have capacity to train them up in a godly fashion. But the only thing a parent really needs to do because of the uniqueness of the children, they're all different. Some are introverts more and some are extroverts. Some are gifted in the arts and some aren't. Some are more going to be inclined to go this way and that way. Teach them what pleases God. If you don't do that, to me, you failed as a parent. Teach them what pleases God. Don't make them like you and don't overcompensate so that they're not like mother or father. <laughs> because that brings us to the next point. Honor your mother and father that life might go well with you. Now, some of you may have had some really dysfunction there. Some of you may not have had mothers and fathers. But the point is, the way you honor them is you release forgiveness to them so that you're standing on an even playing field. Otherwise, you will see every boss like your father. You'll see all authority figures like your father. You will see God like your father. And that's not the original intent, nor are you meeting the original need by allowing God to reveal himself to you. You have taken on an identity that is not the new creation. Matter of fact, let's, uh, honoring your mother and father means you don't honor their bad deeds 
You honor them by forgiving them and learn from it. You don't have to do the opposite because that can be a judgment in itself. What you need to do is go to God and let him conform you, transform you. Come from that place of value in him, that, he, that you're precious in his sight and you're one of a kind. That's who I want transforming my life. Not some method, not patterns modeled after what I don't want as well as what I want. Now, you can't skip steps. So I noticed that in these law of relationship, the solution to meeting that need righteously was I must understand sowing and reaping. I need to understand that sowing and reaping has a law of increase. You sow the bad stuff, be not deceived, God's not mocked, but you sow, you will reap. But you reap a harvest, it's not equal. Because uh, growing up on the south side of Chicago, I thought sowing and reaping was kind of uh, interesting. It was like, um, okay, so I punch him, I punch my neighbor, and then I say I'm sorry. Or I punch my neighbor, he punches me back there, we're even. Doesn't work that way. Because the punching is still in here. The anger is still in there, and it's going to grow. I said, oh, so in other words, Dennis, you punch your neighbor, he punches you back. You're not even, as a matter of fact, that anger is growing on the inside of you. Oh, and you know what else that means? Because there is sowing and reaping. That means you're going to get periodically punched the rest of your life. You're going to reap a harvest from that. How do you like that idea? I would rather repent and forgive, wouldn't you? I don't want to get punched the rest of my life. Because then I get a victim and tell everybody's picking on me. Guess what? You're bringing it to pass <laughs> with your sowing. The beauty of forgiveness and repentance goes without saying. It's the only way you get back on even ground. Now, in uh, train them to please God and not to skip steps. Now, if you read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, I, I want to get back to that word precious. Five things that are precious. In 1 and 2 Peter, these are the things they say precious. I want to get back to that word precious because that was the way God instilled in me the reality of my value, intrinsically, internal value, as a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. You're a one of a kind. And treasure that relationship that we have because it's a one of a kind relationship. It's me and him. And what the, the precious stone is who? That's the Lord himself in 1 Peter. He, is, he laid in Zion a precious stone. You want to be built in this house? There's no other foundation. He's precious. And you need to see his reality as precious. You're not just a fair weather Christian that when everything's going good, you're one who says, I have one thing in my life that's precious and that's him. And if he never did another thing in my life, I will live for him and serve him all the days of my life. That's precious. Precious has to be real, not just some emotional concept. It has to be real awareness. Secondly, the preciousness of the blood of the Lamb. The precious blood. What was precious about that blood? It took you out of that old nature into the new, to where God is your father. You know, you were under the influence of the devil as your father. You may have thought your earthly father was the devil, but as long as you had an attitude and were unsaved, your father was a devil. Jesus told that to the religious people who thought they had it together. You say Abraham's your father. The devil is your father. And he was a liar from the beginning. Whoa. That was religious people that thought they had it together. That's why you cannot have these needs met unrighteously. You can't skip steps. You can't fake it. So he was a precious stone. It was the precious blood, the precious promises. Jason did this uh, two weeks back. I think it was on uh, October 31st. Jason preached the message that really is important because 
Uh, his message was on the precious promises. And these precious promises, the reason they're, they're so precious is they are that which causes you to escape the corruption that's in the world. He gave you these exceedingly great promises to escape the corruption that's in the world and get under Father's love. Then he talks about the precious faith in 2 Peter. And it was equally given to everyone who's a believer. When we say our Father, we mean everyone in this room, everyone listening that's born again, he's our Father and he gave each a measure of faith. But that faith is going to be tested. Not faith being tested in the present tense, but that life of faith will have a final exam. You need to understand that, that, that it's the outcome of your faith that God talks about as precious. The precious, he calls it the precious proving of your faith in 2 Peter 1.7. It's like the final exam. I remember having a, a friend of mine, IQ 177, and he wanted to check my uh, uh, my spiritual father said, Dennis is okay. He said, well, I'm going to check him out anyway. Having a guy with IQ 177 who had the school of um, um, biblical theology, and he wanted to check me out. When he got all done, he goes, um, uh, hmm, I guess he was satisfied. And uh, he said, you have an unusual way of thinking with grids. Well, I call them how-tos, grids. He says, very refreshing, very good. Very refreshing, very good. And uh, <laughs> But he said, something that never left me. Remember, Dennis, he said, you, everything you ever started worked. Whether it was a parachurch ministry, a, a book, a whatever, uh, systems and stuff that I did with other pastors. He said, everything you've done, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Forgetting those things which are behind, accomplishments, pressing on to what lies ahead, walking in that obedience. It's not how you start, it's how you finished. And I thought that was pretty profound. I gave him credit for his... 177 IQ, and you know how I know it was 177 IQ. He made sure he told us all. <laughs> but anyway, now, freedom from the orphan spirit. You're saying, this is the freedom from the orphan spirit, by the way, but this is the practical way you do it. You go from original intent to your original need, right? Then the four spiritual laws or how to implement the solution to getting those needs met righteously. Now we're going to mess with you, if this hasn't. We're going to talk about what I believe God is doing, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, and, <clears throat> and keeping in mind that, biblically speaking, there's four fathers. <laughs> Oh boy, now you're really going to say, oh my goodness, my life was hard enough now. Now he's telling me there's four fathers. Yes, there's four fathers. Did a message on that some time ago. But it's, um, there's God as your father, if you're a born again believer, right? You had a natural father. You have spiritual fathers. All through your life you had spiritual fathers, mentors, teachers, Male or female, doesn't matter. It's how they implemented mentoring in your life. Now, remember, you can't skip steps. So, God is a father. I have a natural father. There are spiritual fathers, mentors, and teachers. And then there's the father of the devil. Well, we don't want him. We, we don't need him. Well, I don't want Jesus saying, your father is a devil. Yeah, all right. All right. Now, my natural father probably thought I was the devil because I was one bad kid, Dennis the Menace. I didn't earn that name for no reason at all. But here's what God's saying. 
to get free from the orphan spirit, we've got to meet these needs righteously. And he's made an availability. And as complicated as this message might start, sound, it's actually quite simple. Those groups of four was the way God made you. If you really wanted to just live the way God made you and not your better ideas, not being afraid, thinking you can skip a step because you're afraid that the world, the flesh, and the devil is standing in the way, or you think the preacher's standing in the way of you accomplishing, your boss is standing in your way. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It's God who lifts up one and puts down another. So don't worry about who's standing in your way. That's, a, that's, that's the voice of the enemy. It's the voice of religion even. Now, freedom from the orphan spirit, we need to understand reparenting. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty. <laughs> Reparenting is mothering and fathering. The mothering example is, you know, mom gets all the kids up, gives them all lunch, sends them to school. That's the way we taught it the first time. Right? Equal. Equal treatment. Different kids, equal treatment. Mothering sees to it that everybody gets out of bed, feeds them uh, breakfast or what have you, get their books, homework, get them all ready to go, and then scoot them out the door or drive them to uh, school or whatever. All right? That's mothering. The mother provides an atmosphere. You have to pay attention to this because we have to have this. We have to have it. You may have had a good mother, you may have had a bad mother, I don't know. You may have had a good father, you may have had a bad father. But quite frankly, mothering in the Christian concept of the face should make you feel loved, safe, and secure. When properly done in the natural, the child are treated equal. That's mothering. You create your children equal, even if you've got some wild ones, you've got some tame ones, and you've got some in-between ones, <laughs> you still treat them equally. Now, with fathering, here's where you can find out if you have some need. You go, how do I know? How do I know what you're talking about? How do I know if I need it? Oh, this is the simplest thing. When we would travel church to church, we would do this one, and we've got plenty to work with. Kept us busy the rest of the week. Huh. Here it is. Here's the question. On a scale of 1 to 10, what was it like growing up with Father? How secure did you feel? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being outstandingly secure and safe. On a scale of 1 to 10, this is for you to be honest with you. Not, not, there's no right answer for someone else. This is a right answer for you. Do the same thing with your mother. On a scale of 1 to 10, how safe did I feel? How secure did I feel growing up? On a scale from 1 to 10, 10 feeling extremely safe. Now, same thing with mother and father. How important was I in the eyes of my father? How significant, use the word significant or important, whatever, in the eyes of my father was I growing up? On a scale of one to ten, pick a number. <clears throat> On a scale of one to ten, how important or significant that I feel with mother growing up. See, everybody's not scoring tens, right? All right, if you're watching my video, nod your head, I'll, I'll feel it. <laughs> Just nod your head. You know it didn't match up to 10. And you know what? It doesn't matter because if you go back to the law, whether you like that law or not, the law of sowing and reaping, if we would release forgiveness for their bad behavior, I mean thoroughly, 
release forgiveness to them and release them from the demands and expectations to change. I know adults in their in their 70s still waiting for their 85, 90 year old parent to change. You release that demand and expectation and you open a portal in heaven to get it from God. You cannot get it righteously from God if you won't release the demands and expectations that you've placed on other people to change. You do not make other people change. That's playing God, trying to make them in, what, your image, the way you think they should be shaped? How dare the clay say to the maker, what have you made here? Let me show you how to do it. <laughs> Whether that's to yourself or someone else, that's not your jurisdiction. That father's the devil. Now, God says, now without mothering in first place, uh, if mothering isn't successful, even in Kingdom Life Church, uh, you won't stay. Uh, because fathering puts pressure on you. And you've got to first, before you can have pressure. Well, picture these little kids. Mama gets all the kids together. You got the good kid, the bad kid, the quiet kid, the loud kid, <laughs> the one that doesn't know what to do. And mom gets them all ready, gets them all lunch, gets them all to school. And guess what? And this, this, is, this is a spiritual concept of mothering and fathering that doesn't depend on whether they're male or female. All right? You could have a woman school teacher and these kids that were all loved and given a lunch and, and mom, mom sent them out to school all the same and then they go to school and they're tested. One gets an A, one gets a B, one gets a... How dare you? I don't like that part of growing up. I liked where I was taken care of. I liked the part where everybody was treated equal. They're, they're the, the nanny state, socialist, communist governments love to get nanny state in there. Well, we'll take care of you. You don't have to do nothing. You could just stay in the womb and everything will come to you because you're entitled and you're special. That's a perversion of special. You have intrinsic value. You're one of a kind. But go with the identity of the new creation that God gave you, not the world. The world's trying to imitate what God has for you that is far superior. Now, that's why they call it a nanny state. And, oh, people are such suckers for anything free. You give them free to make them a slave. Give them something free so that you own them. You indoctrinate them. You make them know they cannot survive without you. Now, it takes mothering approach. Um, let's use a church setting because that's what I've done my whole life. You have natural family and you have different responses in the natural family. You don't try to make them like you. You try to find out what their uniqueness is and get, make space for that to grow. But even if you don't do that real well as a parent, guess what? You teach them, what's the primary thing? Train up a child in the way she'll go? Teach them what pleases God. Then it's in their court. You can't make them serve God, but it's in their court. If you taught them, this is what pleases God. They can accept or reject, but you teach them what pleases God. And what we're teaching now, everything in here pleases God because it's coming from the Scripture. God didn't put anything in the Scripture to not bring you trained and elevated and brought to full stature. Full stature. I can remember in my first church, I had evangelicals that were biblically literate, and they begged me to be simpler. And God said, don't you dare. And I said, well, why? Why? I'm a new preacher, and if it's too complicated, and he showed me a black x-ray machine, and it was like it went over the congregation, and he showed me big, big heads, cerebral people with itsy-bitsy spirits that were atrophied. He said, it's not, what you're preaching is not too complicated, but you're preaching to their spirit to grow and they don't realize that they're still children. They're looking at themselves at their chronological age, but spiritually, they're children. Itsy bitsy spirits 
but big, big heads. You can grow in knowledge forever and never come to a, the revelational knowledge of the truth or the reality of Jesus. So what do we need? As a congregation, as an individual, you need the security that comes from God. So God, in a sense, wants to mother you with his love, affection, treating you equally. He gave you each a measure of faith. He treated you all equal. That's the mothering part. That's the part you like. And without that in place, you will not learn. It takes mothering, whether by a male or a female, to create an environment of rested, fed, well-resourced child at school. You know, in all the years I was ministering, I never had anybody say, hey, I'm not being fed there. Most of the time it was like I'm throwing up from having too much food stuffed down my throat. <laughs> but anyway, that's why you can always listen twice. You can always take notes. Hmm? Here a little, there a little. Okay. Now, after mothering has reached high tide, let's say, all right, I agree, finally. I go to Kingdom Life, I don't know, a little, they're a little shaky. Yeah, Jennifer, I don't know, she's a little shaky. Uh, Dennis is a little shaky. But I'm starting to feel safe and secure. All right. Now the pressure is the boot camp situation. <laughs> what happens in boot camp? When I was in the Army, you know, they, they wanted you to find out what you're made of. Well, I like the mothering part better, where everybody's treated equal, and we're all safe and secure, we're all given lunch, and we're all taken care of. My, my drill sergeant in basic training said, he, was, uh, he must have been from, uh, yeah, he goes, all right, I'm your mother, I'm your father. You don't have a mother and a father anymore, I'm him. And I'm going, oh, no, I'd have never picked him in a million years. <laughs> But there was a reason for it, because he was going to unpack us. He was going to see what we were made out of. And we, not so much him seeing it even, as much as we needed to see it. So generally, children do not like the pressure from fathering components. They love going to school for lunch and the playground. But tests and quizzes, that's fathering. That's, see what's in there and pulling it out. Finding out the differences in you that we can bless you with it because God made you like that. Develop that good stuff that's in there and it will be different from the person next to you. I know we like equal. I know we all like the same. <laughs> but you have a right to succeed. You have a right to fail. That's life. That's real life. Not the fairness doctrine has to die. Life's not fair. So mothering is a type of womb. The environment was pretty special. It allowed the body to develop passively, but that's about all that happened in there. All right? Mothering. Uh, and you know what? Jesus mothered the disciples. I mean, he was with them day in and day out. Endless conversations. He encouraged them and reassured them. But then that school teacher gives the fathering, communication, ideas, designs, a series of activities. Oh, just what I didn't want to do, that teacher's making me do. Come on, did you ever shuffle your feet or anything in school that you didn't feel like doing what they're telling you to do? But you know what? That's part of life. Someday, you're going to have a boss, and they're going to tell you to do something you don't like to do. And what's in you will come out, good or bad. The fathering is absolutely necessary. And I remember in the development, you know, dad leads by being a good example if it's done properly and disciplines his children, teaches the skills, setting up this and doing that and how to mow the lawn, how to start the lawn mower and for the girls how to stay away from boys and <laughs> give them the father look, clean your gun when they come over when they're older. Give them that father look. I had to do that in the mall a lot with Allison when she was a teenager. 
The guys, guys are not very subtle. Sometimes they go like this. They go. And so that's when the father look at to come and go. <laughs> All right. But can you see that it's a natural part of life, but we desperately need both. And, you know, there are people that I say orphan spirit. I'm talking about people who had mothers and fathers. How much more the ones that didn't have it have nothing to compare it to, good or bad. You need it from God because nobody's left out. As a matter of fact, some who were orphaned in real life and didn't have a mother or father that they knew of actually had to find out what was appropriate. And in many cases, that they were the better for it. Um, the fathering approach, his goal is I want to release and unpack, just like in the military, I want to release and unpack that person's potential. Now, I can't make them do something. As a matter of fact, when they, if somebody gets bold enough to say, Pastor, what are my giftings? I'll say, start loving people in action, and let me watch how you love people. Some are going to love people by serving <coughs> quietly in the background. Others, I got to talk. <laughs> I got to explain, you know, others will help set up chairs. I can remember one future pastor when he was young, he would chit chat to everybody who would listen to his sermon while everyone else was moving chairs and tables. He just, it just didn't dawn on him that he could actually help in a different way. So you see there's gifts and there's strengths. Well, some of those strengths need to be channeled properly, but <clears throat> The children, as a rule, do not like fathering. So let's transfer that back to the church now. The part that you wouldn't like was being, you would like being ministered to, but when I put the pressure on and say, you who have been ministered to, let's minister to somebody else. Oh, I liked it the other way. Remember that lady when we traveled that one church came forward, Jennifer, and came forward there, and I said, all right, now. I said, put your hand down here. We're going to go to the Jesus in you. Jesus in me? I came up here for you to pray for me. She only verbalized what other people think. It's about what's in it for me, not how can I please the king. How can I, how can I bless other people? It's not other people oriented. They have not been properly fathered. They're still primarily thinking of what's in it for me. And you can stay mothered. I don't care if you're 75 years old. You can still be only no mothering. You've never known fathering. You've never reproduced according to kind. You've been mothered and you mother, male or female, and you mother. You don't father. Father wants to protect. What, what is that uh, chemical that's even in men? Visopressin. Vasopressin. Oxytocin is for bonding. Vasopressin should be in the male, just being male, not saved or unsaved, saved or unsaved, where it wants to protect, guard, provide for the female. That should be a given. But you may have been so mothered either by your social ideology, <laughs> you know, or in life, that was your experience of love. That's not love. Love is unpacking and releasing the potential in an individual, not stifling them to need you to fall all over them. Making them jelly sandwiches. All right? So mothering has to precede fathering, but fathering has to precede, I mean, follow mothering. The more challenging the fathering environment, the more the person's potential gets unpacked. That's why Navy SEALs go through what they go through. Not everybody gets unpacked. But the training, the more the pressure is put on to release their potential, the more they know what they're capable of doing and the more they can help other people. EMS. Fire department, <clears throat> good examples of literally running to the fire when everyone else is running away from the fire. That kind of character is made. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. Now, Jesus fathered his disciples. Now, how did he do it? Remember, he gave them so much attention. He talked to them day and night. He loved them. Ooh, I like that part, right? 
we just hang out with Jesus all day. And we eat and eat and drink with Jesus. And he tells us stories and we learn. And but then look what he did to them. After a while, he fathered them. You know what he told them to do? He sent them out on their own with no mothering resources. He told them, I expect them to draw on what's inside of them, not from some safety net. Don't take money, don't take this, don't take that, don't... What? Yeah, it's time. It's time for you to go and make disciples. And to make a true disciple, you have to be one. You have to be a son unto the Father before you will ever be a father to sons. Hear that, because that's for men and women. When we use sons and fathers. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, you will then be like them. You will be unpacked and reproducing according to kind. Now remember, the focus is mothering. Make a distinction here. If you're a note taker, just be good to write down. Mothering is on equality. Fathering is making the distinctive differentiations with their giftings and their abilities because you want to enhance the way God put in them. Achievement is fathering. Children excel at different things and they fail at other things. But you're focusing that child on future potential. You'd be surprised how right before I saw a release in some Christians, they quit in one way or another. There's all different ways of quitting. Uh, I'm not saying they backslid totally. They just quit because they reached that peak where they could be unpacked and they thought they could skip a step. And I'm valuable now. I know how to do stuff. I'm taking off to purpose. You can't skip the purpose. When you truly understand your value, God, promotion doesn't come from the east or west. God lifts up one and puts another. You do not skip steps. When you go back over your notes over this whole thing, look at the steps. But mothering requires fathering. We're going to get free from that orphan spirit. Mothering alone is not enough. Receiving information alone is not enough. You can sit in church all day. Passive Acquisition of information does not work. You have to under, there are most people understand more than they can do. Information, not transformation. Knowing who we are is not the same as unpacking who we are. It requires doing, not just listening. And you have to take it serious to do that. Freedom from that orphan spirit. I love that in the one example, I'm going to give this with closing, is where Paul did both mothering and fathering. He says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, but we were gentle among you, just like a nursing mother cherishes her own children, well pleased to impart only, not only the gospel, but you had become dear to us. That's a mothering principle. Then later in the verse, in verse 11, as you know how we exhorted comfort, and charged you. Oh, that's, that's fathering. We charged you, commissioned you, every one of you, go do something with this gospel. <laughs> As a father does with his children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. There in a small portion of scripture, he demonstrates the, the mothering and the fathering just as Jesus did. Amen? You need both, right? You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.